Jesus calls us, but what if we're too busy that we don't hear? Jesus calls us, but are we prepared to follow him? Let us listen with our hearts, for Jesus is calling us. Jesus calls us to grow in love and fellowship with one another. May the Lord show us what we are to do and give us courage to follow. Well, greetings and welcome to this time of worship coming to you from Walker Chapel at Rocky River Presbyterian Church in Rocky River, Ohio. I'm John Fancher, the pastor of the church, and I'm so glad that you're here as God's Holy Spirit draws us together to worship. Let us pray. Creator of all, you speak, but we fail to listen. You guide, but we fail to follow. You move, but we remain stuck and stagnant in the same patterns of destruction and sin. Free us from our failures, holy God. Save us from ourselves so we can hear and heed your call. Amen. Our words of assurance come from Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Friends, let us be happy. Let us live in freedom. For living in Jesus Christ and Jesus living in us, our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now we turn to Scripture for inspiration and instruction. Both of today's Bible readings come from the New Testament of the Bible. The first passage, from the letter to the Hebrews, commends believers for their work in showing the love and the mercy of Jesus. From Hebrews chapter 6. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you have helped His people and continue to help them. And then the reading from the Gospel according to Luke recalls the day when Jesus sent out the disciples to minister on their own for the first time. Here's from Luke chapter 9. Jesus called the twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Then he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, after saying to them, Take nothing with you for the trip, no walking stick, no beggar's bag, no food, no money, not even an extra shirt. Wherever you are welcomed, stay in the same house until you leave that town. Wherever people don't welcome you, leave that town and shake the dust off your feet as a warning to them. So the disciples left and they traveled through all the villages, preaching the good news and healing people everywhere. And so from Luke's Gospel, we just heard the report that one day Jesus sent the disciples out. Preach the kingdom of God, he told them. Heal people who are sick. Did you ever wonder what it must have been like for them? I mean, where exactly did they go? Who went where? What did they do when they got wherever it was they ended up? How did they start? You see, the disciples had been following Jesus for some time, days or weeks, maybe months even, certainly not years. So far, they had listened to Jesus preach to others. He addressed some lessons to them. They'd watch as he brought healing to mind and body and spirit. But Luke's gospel doesn't tell us about Jesus ever teaching them how to preach the kingdom of God or drive out demons or cure diseases. So how did they know what to do? When I was a seminary student in Chicago, I spent one summer 
enrolled in a full-time hospital chaplaincy program. There were, I think, um, five of us from four different seminaries in this program under the direction of the hospital's chaplain. Our first morning together for the program was spent uh, in get, a, get acquainted chats, a walking tour of the hospital, overviews of what the summer program would hold for us, uh, getting our photos taken for our hospital ID badges. After lunch in the hospital cafeteria, we returned to our conference room, and there the chaplain told us that each of us would be assigned to work in a particular unit of the hospital. My assignment was split between a medical surgical floor and the pediatrics floor. After each of us had our assignments and had figured out where in the hospital we were to go, the chaplain said, okay, let's see, it's 1.15, come back at 3. And then he got up and he walked to his office, leaving us there. We looked at each other. He hadn't told us what exactly we were to do once we reached our floors. What were we supposed to say? How do you be a chaplain? He hadn't told us. Well, ten weeks later, at the end of the program, we understood. The immersive experience was intended to teach us to see ourselves as ministers because that's how others were going to view us. They weren't going to dismiss us merely as only seminary students or just chaplain interns. As far as that person in the hospital bed was concerned, we were ministers and they expected us to engage with them in that capacity. Well, recalling that sink or swim experience all those years ago, I wonder if the disciples felt anything like that when Jesus said, okay, fellas, go out there and preach, teach, heal. I'll see you when you get back tonight. I mean, what did they do? What did they say? How did they divide up? Mark's gospel says they went out in pairs, but the other gospels don't tell us anything about that. And who decided which villages to visit? It wouldn't have flown if the disciples tried to tell people, you've heard of that awesome teacher, Jesus? Well, I'm here in his place. No, the disciples needed to proceed as if they already were what they hoped to become. Several years ago, the Huffington Post's blog featured an article whose title encouraged readers to dress for the career you want, not the one you have. The author was uh, restating some of the work that had been done decades ago by John T. Malloy in his books, whose titles encouraged readers to dress for success. Malloy shared his research, which indicated that for both men and women, one way of achieving vocational goals was to adopt the attire of the position you wanted. Well, when I got out of college and years before I thought about going to seminary, I worked for Procter & Gamble. And one of my fellow salesmen loaned me Malloy's book, Dress for Success. And it wasn't too long before I got myself a dark blue pinstripe suit, white or blue shirts with button-down collars, conservative striped ties, a pair of black wingtip shoes, that was how a male Procter & Gamble manager dressed in those days. I was only a lowly field sales rep, but I was determined to give the appearance that I had already climbed a rung or two on the corporate ladder. So learning how to be a chaplain by, well, by being a chaplain, dressing for the position you want to attain. Both provide an idea about how we might approach being a follower of Jesus, just proceeding as if we already are what we hope to become. Do we live Christ-like lives? Well, at times, sure. All the time? <laughs> Who are we kidding? I mean, we aspire to be patient and understanding of all people, but we get annoyed by the newbie whose lack of familiarity with how things work ends up inconveniencing us. We want to be loving and respectful, 
but we badmouth that person whose social or political or religious viewpoints differ so greatly from our own. We want to be non-judgmental and accepting, but we disparage unfamiliar customs or behaviors or preferences that we don't understand. As far as embodying the spirit of Jesus in our daily lives, our disciple report cards would be far from displaying straight A's. We don't measure up. But Jesus calls us to follow nonetheless. Jesus wants us to do our best to present his love, which is gracious and generous, to show his acceptance, which is unconditional and merciful, to embody his forgiveness, which is undeserved and thus precious beyond measure. Jesus accepts us as we are, inviting us to live into what he wants us to become. This is true for us individually, and it's also true for us as a church. We are a a collection, a, a congregation of imperfect but sincere believers who are striving to embody the Spirit of Jesus. Don't you think that this anonymous poem describes us? I think that I shall never see a church that's all it ought to be, a church whose members never stray beyond the straight and narrow way, a church who has no empty pews, whose pastor never has the blues, a church whose stewards never stew or shirk the job that's theirs to do, where gossips never peddle lies or make complaints or criticize. Such perfect churches there may be, but none of them are known to me. But still, we'll work and pray and plan to make our church the best we can. This church has no illusions of being perfect, but we move ahead as if we already are what we hope to become. And that persistence, that hope, That vision of what's possible helps us progress toward our goal. Believing in the vision of what's possible. It's illustrated in a story that comes from the College of William and Mary, founded in the colony of Virginia in the year 1693. For a century and a half, this prestigious Virginia school had been a leader among American universities. And then came the Civil War. In the hard years of Reconstruction that followed, the College of William and Mary went bankrupt. Soon it had a deserted campus, decaying buildings, no students. As with so many Southern schools after that tragic war, everyone wrote it off as dead. Everyone except its president, He had given his best years to advancing the liberal arts through that school, and he refused to give up now. So every morning from 1881 to 1888, every morning, President Ewell went to the deserted deserted campus. He climbed the tower of its main building and rang the bells calling the students to class. He behaved as though the school was still there. People thought he was crazy. Nevertheless, every day for seven years, President Ewell rang the bells at William and Mary in defiance of the despair and hopelessness that could destroy everything he held valuable. Well, eventually and miraculously, it worked. Others caught his vision. Students, teachers, and money returned. And today... America's second oldest university thrives again, in part because of the hope of a single man who acted as if he was already living what he hoped to see. So what does it look like when we live as though we already are what we hope to become? What's it look like when we see ourselves as personal agents of the love and compassion of Jesus? Well, preacher and professor Martin Copenhaver describes what it looks like in one church. He shares this story. He writes, My cousin Pam lived alone on a 
small New Hampshire farm that she inherited from her parents. We did not see each other often, but trust me, the contours of her face and particularly the cadence of her voice were such that you wouldn't need a DNA test to know that we are related. Well, another cousin told me that Pam's cancer had returned, indeed, that death was near. How sad, I thought, to approach death alone. So I got in my car and wended my way through the serpentine roads of New Hampshire. When I got near the little town of Hebron, New Hampshire, the GPS system quit. I guess this was one small remote place it did not recognize. So I stopped at the small congregational church where I interrupted a Bible study and asked if anyone knew where Pam Yinger lives. They all knew. One member of the group accompanied me back to my car to point out the road that I should take. But when I got to Pam's house, the driveway was clotted with cars. Inside, there was a gentle hum of activity. I was greeted by my cousin, Michael, There was a woman making tea. A few others just seemed to be hanging out. One of them took me in to see Pam in the living room, which was festooned with more trinkets than a flea market. Pam and I chatted for a bit. I learned that, except for my cousin, all the people in the house were from her church. They took turns throughout the day and night so she would be cared for round the clock. Before I left, this small handful of God's people in a land that the GPS forgot, they held hands with Pam and one another, and we prayed. And after I said amen, Pam added her own, thank you, dears. It's not like the people in that little church in that tiny New England town It's not like they achieved Christ-like perfection. What they'd resolved to do, though, was to live as though they already were what they hoped to become. And that's a good starting point for you and me, too. To live as though we already are the capable, faithful agents of Christ's love. We already are the agents that we hope to become. Amen. Well, in this community of faith, in this church, we care for and pray for the world and for one another. One of the ways we do that each week is by selecting at random some members of our church to be in our prayer focus for the week ahead. And this week in our prayer focus, we hold John, Jeremy and Laura, and their children, Zachariah and Eliana, Patricia, and Diana and Ron. And among our prayer requests today and this week, we pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia who desire simply to live their daily lives and whose prayers are for peace in the face of conflict. We pray for God's protection and guidance for Jack, Elizabeth, Jonathan, Kate, and the Davis and Kelleher families. We continue to pray for God's blessings of healing and strength for Dan, for Lewis, for Pamela, for Brenda, and Molly. And we pray that Paul and Julius may have peace of mind and comfort in these difficult days. Let us pray. All-seeing God, our infinitely compassionate Creator, we close our eyes, bow our heads, search our hearts as we pray that we would become more willing to open our minds to consider your grace and mercy. In a modern world fixated on that which is rational and can be explained and understood, we confess that we cannot explain you We cannot understand how you can be so gracious and generous, so forgiving and loving. But what we cannot comprehend, we can nevertheless accept. 
We accept our role as creatures formed by your own hand. We accept your love made real to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. For through his words and manner, Jesus showed us how to live with your love. So that's our prayer this day, that we will show the love of your son Jesus at all times, not just when we're thinking about it, not just when we know it will be noticed. Renew our minds to embrace our life in Christ as an everyday part of who we are. We ask this, invoking the name of the one we seek to serve, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for being part of this worship experience. We welcome any feedback you may want to give us. We also welcome prayer requests. If you would like to share prayer requests with us, you can provide as much or as little detail as you'd like. And please let me know if you would like me to share your prayer request in upcoming services or if you would like me to hold your prayer request in pastoral confidence. We thank you for your financial gifts and your offerings which make possible our charitable mission outreach and our ministries. You can make gifts by dropping them off at the church or putting um, a gift in the mail using your bank's bill pay program or you can donate through our website, which is www.riverpress.org. You'll find new worship broadcasts posted on our church's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. They're posted every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch them at your convenience anytime after that. In addition to these worship broadcasts, our church offers in-person worship services in our sanctuary on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. Also, on Ash Wednesday, March 2nd at 7.30 p.m., we will offer a communion service in the sanctuary to begin the season of Lent. A worship video for that service will be posted earlier on Ash Wednesday. As a reminder, masks are required for anyone in the church building. Now hear these words of benediction. Open your ears to God's chosen Son. Open your minds to understanding. Open your hearts to transformation. Open your hands to receive blessing and offer blessing. And may the grace of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, be with you now and always. Amen.